Tall Tale TV. Whole Lot of Shaken, a Tony Mandolin short story by Robert Beers. Chapter 5. Sam Clemens came in late and was roundly harangued by Roosevelt for being a lazy good-for-nothing, and then he sat next to me, saying, Mr. Mandolin, so good to see you, boy. Bain took the time to catch the eye of every player before dealing, and then he intoned, This is five-cod stud. No fancy shifts, no hold'em nonsense, and none of that idiotic baccarat add-ons the Easterners are trying to mix in. You will be dealt five cards. Check them over and then discard what you don't like. The dealer will give you one chance at getting a better hand. But don't blame me if all you get is junk. Michael Hall excused herself from the table, saying, I believe I will just watch this time. I took my cards and kept them on the table, lifting the corners just enough to see what I'd been dealt. I saw a pair of threes and the rest was junk. But in a game like this, that could be a winning hand. I'd have to gauge the players' faces for tells. Clemens picked up his cards, looked around at the table, and then, through a blown smoke ring, said, I'll open with my ante, plus two dollars. Everyone anteed, and then Green said, What's that? A green dollar bill was sitting on top of the coins. I'd tossed in one of my silver dollars, per Bain's advice. Clemens chuckled. We all know the rules. Almost everyone, including the president, chanted, if, if it, it don't, don't clink, clink, it's, it's a, a dink. dink. Frankie asked across the table at me, What's a dink? Craig chuckled. You really do not want to know. Sorry. Swift Hook retrieved the bill and tossed in a coin. I didn't know. I noticed only Silver sat in the middle of the table. Bane then said, Very well. The game can now begin. Look at your cards, ladies and gentlemen, and then tell the house how many chips you wish to buy. Unlike the gambling houses along the wharf, this house will not extend credit. You gamble with what you have, nothing more. By the time the buy-in was completed, I counted over a couple hundred dollars in chips being distributed around the table. The values ranged from a quarter all the way up to two dollars. In 2017 money, I was looking at thousands of dollars in enameled wood. Bain said, Mr. Clemens has opened with two dollars. Mr. Mandolin, you are next. You may match or fold. What is your choice? Now, I'd played my share of poker in a variety of styles, but this type was new, and I kind of liked it. I had the feeling it was Bane's own take on the game, and in acting as host, he kept the game moving as well as reducing the threat of a temper tantrum. I tossed in a $2 chip, more curious than anything else. Miss Swifthook? She placed her cards on the table. I thought she was folding, but she said, I will add a dollar to Mr. Clemens' bet. Roosevelt chuckled. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a shark in our waters. Bain smiled and said, Lord Harris, that makes it three dollars for you to stay. Harris smiled and put his cards on the table. Not even the esteemed Admiral Dewey could save this vessel. So, Bain murmured, Mr. Jackson, match, raise, or fold? Frankie slid a $2 and a $1 chip across the table. I'm in, he rumbled. I recognized that tone. The big guy was already in fantasy land. I hope he wasn't thinking he was Cool Hand Luke or something like that. That left Professor Van Meter, who also folded, and Green, who tossed in a pair of chips, saying, Not this time, Clemens, not this time. Both Craig and Roosevelt stayed in. Ducky Smith eyed Swifthook from behind her cards one predator sensing another in her hunting ground. Then she tossed in three dollar chips and put her hand down. All right, let's see who has a pair big enough to stay in. Frankie chuckled. Roosevelt laughed so hard he nearly fell out of his chair. Clemens smiled and blew a smoke ring. Bane just said, deadpan, Cods, Mr. Clemens? When it came around to me, I took three and then watched and waited as the rest of the cards were dealt out. As far as tells were concerned, I saw several possibilities, but nothing definite. Roosevelt twitched his right eyebrow now and then, but it could just be that, a twitch. Craig chewed his lip, and Smith's nostrils flared. The other players had similar signs. Frankie had gone entirely flat, which meant he was either Luke or the Cincinnati Kid. Either way, I was getting nothing out of him. Swifthook was another blank slate. 
but that could be the reporter more so than the person. A good reporter can step out of the way and simply record what is happening rather than injecting opinion. That is a breed so rare these days, it's almost extinct. Swift Hook seemed to be one of those. Bain then said, Very well. Mr. Clemens, the bet falls to you as you began this round. Clemens' eyes twinkled as he tossed in a pair of two-dollar chips. There you go, folks. Let's raise the rent. I lifted the corner of my cards and checked. Yes, the other twos were still there. I'd gotten lucky and drew four of a kind, but I also didn't want to appear to be too confident either. I matched Clemens' bet without a word. So did Swifthook. We lost two more players before it got to Frankie. Both Green and Craig dropped their cards under the table. Roosevelt chuckled and stayed in, matching Clemens' raise. Smith smiled big, showing teeth, and said, As I said, let's see who has them, and tossed in five two-dollar chips. Whoa! Roosevelt exclaimed. What have you got in that hand, little lady? Clemens never changed expression. Still chuckling, he matched the raise. I figured that four of a kind, even if it was just twos, would be hard to beat. So I matched, keeping silent. Frankie tossed a handful of chips onto the table. Double it, he said. Oh, God, I thought. He's gone cool hand Luke on me. Michael Hall purred. Mr. Bain, you do have good taste in men. Roosevelt tossed his cards on the table, saying, I do believe it's a good time to withdraw from this conflict. That left Ducky Smith to stay, fold, or raise. She stared at Frankie but she may as well have been trying to read the expression of a statue. Bane murmured, Madam, your decision, please. Pursing her lips, she tossed in the cards, muttering, Too big, even for me. It was down to four, the three newbies, as it turned out, and Mark Twain. Roosevelt asked Bane, What, did you bring us three ringers, Landau? Bane replied, Not intentionally, I assure you. Then he said, Mr. Clemens? twenty dollars to stay in. Clemens glanced at each of us, obviously looking for a tell. After a few seconds, and just as Bane was opening his mouth, he shook his head and lay the cards down. Not this round, it appears, he sighed. Miss Swifthook, Bane said, that puts this final round into your control. What is your decision? Stay, raise, or fold? She looked across the table at the big guy and said, I do believe that, given the number of chips before him, Mr. Jackson would simply double the bet again, and I do not have the wherewithal to match him. So, I will call. She pushed her remaining chips into the center of the table. She was right about Frankie. In his present state of mind, he'd just keep saying double it until he was the only one left. I doubted he even had a single pair in that hand. I said, Let's make it an even fifty and see what we have. All right, big guy? Frankie looked down, his lips moving as he counted his remaining chips. Then he shrugged and pushed them all in. Call, he said. Bane said to Swifthook, Miss, I am afraid you do not have the amount needed to stay. She said to me softly, Damn you, Tony Mandolin. I replied, Sorry. Mr. Mandolin, reveal your cards, please. I turned them over, and everyone there except for Bane reacted. Well, that explains it. Would have beaten me. Ooh, beginner's luck. And a sigh from Swifthook with an added, I would have lost even more, I see. Mr. Jackson, your cards, please. Frankie smiled, and as I expected, turned over a pile of junk. The reaction was even more explosive than at my winning hand, and it included applause. Roosevelt stood and reached out to shake Frankie's hand, saying enthusiastically, that was one of the best poker performances I've seen in a long time. Bully, my boy, bully. Bane said, Well then, how about we take a break for smokes and drinks? I looked at the chips and asked, How do these get cashed in? Roosevelt said, Martin takes care of that, and don't worry, the man's a straight arrow all the way. I then said, Thanks. Make sure he gives the money to Miss Swifthook. She gasped, What? I can't take that. I'm not for sale, Mr. Mandolin. I know, I said. But I also know that you're not rich. I don't need that money. Not now, and you do. Bane, I asked. 
What happens if I refuse to take the pot? He shrugged. It is redistributed to the original bettas per their bets. Standard procedure, minus a small fee for the house's trouble. Then I said, turning away, If she won't take it, then do that. I heard an exasperated, Mandolin? as I went out into the open bar. Craig and Van Meter were deep into a conversation as I approached. Craig said, But I've been known to race a few dust buggies across the empty wasteland of science in my day. However, I find Tesla's insistence that this new form of power he's discovered can do as much as he claims. And it certainly does not give credence to Herbert's fiction. It would take a power plant the size of a city, not a chair, to accomplish that feat. Van Meter drank some of his beer and then said, Electromagnetic discharge is a release of light. Light can expand the fluid of time-space. The faster time-space moves over matter, the faster that matter experiences time relative to that which has the fluid of time-space moving over it more slowly. This, of course, would only facilitate fast travel through time while everything slower was seemingly nearly frozen in time. In my opinion, there is never the ability to travel backwards in time. It is a one-way street. The physicists who say it is possible are merely looking at a two-dimensional view of space. Time-space is not merely a flat plane, and it cannot be wrapped back onto itself, nor can it flow in reverse. You gentlemen must be interested in Mr. Wells' writing, I said. It makes for some very active discussions, Craig replied. You, Mr. Mandolin, are a very good poker player, but not as good as your large friend. If the pot had not been limited, you would have lost. I nodded. Probably. Excuse me, gentlemen. I wandered over to where Bain was standing and talking quietly with Clemens and Roosevelt. I said, Do you mind if Frankie and I call it a night? We've had a rather busy day. Roosevelt waved his cigar. No, not at all. Very glad to have met you, my boy. Don't be a stranger. Frankie came over, his eyes just a bit wild. Mr. President, again, sir, it is a real honor. Roosevelt cut him off, saying, Mr. Jackson, it is I who should be honored. Would you object if I had our photographer take a photo of the two of us, for history's sake? Frankie's mouth worked, and then he managed to get out. I, 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 I don't know what to say. I mean... I believe that is a yes, Mr. President, I translated. Bully! Frankie was over the moon as we rode the elevator back down to the fifth floor. I can't believe it, he said for about the seventh time. I simply cannot believe it. I said, you do know you won't be able to tell anyone about this, I reminded him. Oh, I am going to tell someone, he stated. Frankie, I began. Greystoke, he said. I'll tell Greystoke, and I know he won't blab. Whole Lot of Shaken is a short story by Robert Lee Beers, author of the Tony Mandolin Mysteries, the best unknown supernatural mystery series on the planet. The Tony Mandolin Mysteries take place in and around today's San Francisco, and in style are a mashup of Nero Wolf, Harry Dresden, and the Vimes novels of the immortal Sir Terry Pratchett. There are seven finished novels in the series, an eighth in the works, and several short stories offered for free on Kindle Unlimited. If you go to asmbeers.wixsite.com slash robertleebeers, everything is there and more. Hey guys, so in the next couple of weeks, I might be implementing a couple of changes to my format here. Just didn't want you guys to be caught off guard when it happens. But don't worry, the stories aren't going anywhere. Just make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. I'm Chris Heron, and that's it for today's Tall Tale TV.